comorbidities among educators are also being attended to. An agreement with organized labor is about to be completed. Standard operating procedures will be circulated among schools to ensure that schools are able to manage identified infections among educators, learners, educa uh, learners and educators and support staff. In the meantime, whilst we are waiting for the signing of the agreement within education, the health procedures apply until such time we enhance them. Where practically possible, learners from non so ready schools will be moved to neighboring schools that meet the health, safety, and social distancing set measures and requirements. The teaching and learning programs provided online will continue, and parents who are uneasy to send their children back to schools must follow the law to ensure that their children's rights to basic education is unhindered. Today, we have members of the Executive Council present at this brief at this media. I've also invited Rand Water. We've also have also linked with heads of education departments, with MECs, to also engage the public on the state of readiness. And as we conclude, I wish to conclude by acknowledging the immeasurable and highly appreciated support and guidance and stewardship that we got we, that was provided by his president, by his excellency, the president, cabinet, the national COVID-19 command council, and the support that has been provided, as I said earlier, by the Department of Water and Sanitation, Rand Water, the Department of Health, National Treasury, and recently, great support and a boost that we got from the South African National Defense Force, the Development Bank, the Department of Transport, the Mvula Trust, but also different entities of government that came to the fore, and more important also, the support that we got from different communities. Chair, I think I will not be representing my colleagues well if I don't say, and I think we'll mention it at DG, that we have, we have fully appreciated the support that we got from the communities, the support that we got from the private sector, but schools have raised the concerns of visitors in schools and have requested me to make the appeal to say, for now, we are, uh, I think things are fine. We would not wish for people to visit schools if not by appointment to the principal. Because school says they've had people coming to check on their readiness, not wearing masks, and now that they're going to be receiving learners, they will not wish to have other people who are not part of the school establishment mm -hmm. to visit schools. So we're humbly requesting the public not to visit our schools unless it's per appointment with the principal or they have a letter from the district saying they'll be visiting a school, but there should be no other person in the school premises starting from Monday the 8th. And yeah, so we're saying with all respect because people have really been around helping us the whole week, but we just don't think it helps us to maintain the safety standards that we want to do. So Chair, I really want to stop at that. You will guide us how we're going to proceed. As I said earlier, the DG is there to, make, to, to, to provide the report that comes from different provinces, which explains the state of readiness. We also have water and sanitation. I'm sure they are. They can't wait to, to part ways with us. <laughs> we phone them every day and ask for reports twice a day. So they are here to also just give an indication as to where we are. <coughs> and more important, unfortunately, the NCT, until this whole trip is finished, they are stuck with us. But they will also give a sense of where we are in terms of readiness. So I want to thank you very much, uh, Babum Klam. Thank you so much, Minister. We appreciate that presentation. I am now going to ask the Director General of the Department of Basic Education, Mr. Matanze Mamweli, to come and deliver his presentation. Mr. Mamweli, please come to my position here. Uh, Minister, Deputy Minister, uh, the MECs uh, from the nine provinces, uh, colleagues in the room, and uh, across the length and breadth of the country. 
I'm going to present a technical report uh, which is informed by information that we collect on a daily basis. Uh, we do this uh, religiously, uh, gather and tally the numbers in the morning at 9 o'clock and uh, in the afternoon at 4 o'clock. Uh, as the CEO of the NECT reminded us uh, a few days ago that the state of readiness is a relative notion, uh, is not an absolute notion. So we have decided to inform uh, the state of readiness by 14 variables that we look at to bring us close to uh, uh, absolute uh, notion of the state of readiness. Uh, let me start by saying, because Minister was told that people are looking for numbers. Uh, from the readiness of facilities, we have the following figures. In terms of the Eastern Cape, out of 5,064 schools, 4,660 were declared ready from a facilities point of view. Free State, out of 1,123, 1,123 were declared ready. Gauteng, out of 1,917, in fact, sorry, out of 2,017, 9,000, sorry, 1,917 are ready. In other words, out of 2017, Gauteng has got 1,017 uh, ready. KwaZulu Natal, out of 6,000 schools on our count, 5,975 were declared ready. Limpopo, out of 3,711. Uh, uh, 3,711 were declared ready. Mpumalanga, out of 1,815, 1,772 were deemed to be ready. Northern Cape, the province with the biggest uh, pieces of land, uh, out of 556, 556 were declared ready to go. Northwest, out of 1,570, 1,570 were declared ready. Vescap, Western Cape, out of 1,819, 1,816 were declared ready as facilities. All in all, out of 23,000, 675, 23,100 schools were declared ready as facilities to receive learners on Monday. This constitutes 97.6% of the total number of public schools. I'm quickly going to go through the presentation uh, uh, that I'm going to share this uh, this afternoon. This is the outline of the presentation and this is how we provide guidance in the interpretation of the figures and the colors that we have provided on the dashboard. From a national picture as at the 29th of May, uh, which the minister referred to this was the status of readiness, which informed the decision by the minister and the Council of Education ministers to use the week that has just gone past to mop up and to ramp up uh, the provision of outstanding deliverables in the system. You can see that uh, under facilities, there are a number of rates. Under water and sanitation, you've got red. Under basic sanitation and hygiene package, lots of red. Under orientation also, a number of provinces were really not ready. 
Well, as at yesterday, this is the picture. No red, as you can see, nationally. A few amber uh, or colors that are amber. And as you would uh, remember that uh, lots of activity is taking place as we speak. These numbers change like, you know, a laser jet uh, speed. They change very fast. Uh, there's delivery happening as we speak. Delivery happens even overnight in some areas. That's why we tally them 9 o'clock in the morning. We even tally them 4 o'clock in the afternoon. So that is the national picture. Provincial picture, Eastern Cape, we will appreciate that uh, Eastern Cape has uh, the biggest portion of the lion's share in terms of the water tank uh, delivered to them. The only thing that uh, remained was the installation uh, of these tanks. That's why in some of the areas, because our assessment is about the provision of water, not about whether the tank is on site. Uh, that, that is the assessment that we are making. The second point is around the provision of masks in the Eastern Cape, particularly in Over Tambo, in Alfred Nzo, and uh, some areas of the Amatole region, and so on, where the delivery uh, slowed down uh, because of uh, uh, community protest which was precipitated by b local business people who wanted uh, the delivery of COVID essentials to be done by them. And it delayed the delivery in these areas and it brought the performance of the Eastern Cape as a whole down compared to all the nine provinces. So you'll appreciate that when we compare the Eastern Cape with other provinces, the provision of COVID essentials in the Eastern Cape to schools is the lowest, simply because of uh, some of those community protests. We also experienced that to some extent in Gauteng, but law enforcement uh, agents were able to intervene on time, and uh, therefore Gauteng was able to catch up with the rest. Free State, you can see, is green all the way. The blue color simply means that some of those activities are still um, to be carried out in terms of the other groups of learners that are coming. Let me also remind the South African public that we are only receiving 13.4% of the total number of learners. Total number of learners is 13,100,000. Uh, so we're only receiving 1,600,000 learners from Monday, which is 13.4%. Uh, Gauteng, you can see Gauteng also, as I said, it's green all the way, and the numbers are provided there for each of the deliverables broken down into granular detail of what we expected to be delivered by each of the provinces. KwaZulu-Natal, as indicated in the overall um, um, picture of the numbers, there are schools in KZN that are still outstanding, and I think the minister spoke to that. MECs will also speak to that as to how do we bring some of the schools that are still lagging behind in, in terms of state of readiness on board and to make sure that learners attending in those schools are not left behind. Water again in KZN, uh, although we've got uh, quite a number of water tanks, um, you know, in KZN, what still remains is the issue of installation also in KZN. In Limpopo, Limpopo also, um, a, a few areas that are amber, particularly water, and uh, mainly about installation, uh, but uh, in Limpopo, they have all the water uh, tanks that they require. In fact, at some stage, we gathered that they had more than what they required. They, we needed to redirect them to other provinces. Sanitation, we're also moving with sanitation. Um, uh, and again, there are still uh, some schools that uh, still need to be covered in Limpopo. Orientation, some schools didn't complete their orientation this past week, so they'll, they'll still have to do that. But in the main green, as you can see, Mpumalanga, the main issue is, is water uh, installation there, but essentially they've, they've got the tanks that they need. 
Northern Cape, um, um, the only area that still needs attention to catch up with the rest of the other provinces is orientation, uh, which has not been completed in the Northern Cape. In Northwest, essentially green, a few areas, and again, it's about vandalized schools in the Northwest, getting all the vandalized schools repaired, um, water, finalizing installation there, and in terms of orientation, finalizing orientation and as well as screening. Western Cape, essentially green, except for small areas in terms of the repairs of schools, and I think some of the schools that, that require repairs in the, in the Western Cape are not more than 10. We're getting this data every day. We meet 6 o'clock in the morning to evaluate the situation. Uh, so uh, that's, that's, that's what accounts for yellow in the Western Cape, vandalized schools, uh, which is a, an occurrence of all the nine provinces. Quickly, this is the uh, delivery of the phase one uh, uh, project of emergency sanitation. Um, there are uh, areas that the Department of Basic Education is, is responsible for, uh, which are in, in, in red, the ones in blue, it's provincial education departments that are providing sanitation, minimum sanitation for 13.4% of learners will be received by schools tomorrow. I want that to be understood. The number of units that we are providing are um, commensurate to the number of learners that will be receiving tomorrow. We'll continue with phase two in anticipation of the 52% that is coming on the 6th of uh, July, and then uh, also in anticipation of the last group that's coming on the 3rd of uh, August. And this is the breakdown. The minister's speech acknowledged DBSA. We brought in DBSA. We brought in Vula Trust to enhance our capacity to deliver on emergency sanitation. This is the breakdown. As you can see, the total number and the allocation per implementing agent. And these are the main areas where we're delivering Eastern Cape. And we, we, we break down the numbers there as indicated from the total number and breaking it down to per implementing agent. And this is Limpopo. We give a, a geo a location of each of the schools that require emergency portable sanitation. And this is the breakdown in terms of the numbers, and many of these we are still en route to the schools in Limpopo. Uh, in conclusion, this is the uh, breakdown of the timelines of uh, the uh, number of units that will be taken to the schools that are involved in this project. Thank you very much. Thank you, much. Thank you very much, uh, DG. Uh, we appreciate that detailed presentation. I'm sure it will assist in creating some understanding in terms of the work that is being done in the basic education sector to prepare the reopening of schools for learners, uh, particularly those that are in grade 7 and 12. Um, MECs, I'm going to ask that you prepare for a three-minute um, input at the end of the last presentation. We are now going to ask the CEO of... Uh, Rainwater to come through to deliver his presentation. And thereafter, it will be Mr. Kosa from NECT to deliver the NECT-led consortium presentation. And thereafter, we'll be coming to the MECs to give them an opportunity to speak for at least three minutes to tell us about the state of readiness for the opening of schools in their different provinces. Uh, Mr. Mosai, I'm going to ask you to please come through to the stage to deliver the presentation from Randwater. Thank you, Mr. Mslanga. Um, Minister, Deputy Minister, um, DG, 
distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. My name is uh, Sipo Masai. Um, I'm the chief executive of Rainwater. Um, we have been appointed um, the implementing agents on behalf of the Department of Basic Water and Education, Basic Education, um, to on the 8th of May to implement the COVID-19 emergency water supply to schools in the Republic. Essentially, our mandate um, was twofold. Um, one, to provide water tanks to schools with no storage capacity, um, install those tanks and fill them up with water. The, the second part of our mandate was to uh, principally to identify schools um, that have no storage capacity at all, or that have in fact storage capacity, fill those um, tanks up with, uh, with water and get um, the schools ready to open. Uh, primarily ours in this space was to augment the, the work that is principally performed by the municipalities, that of um, filling the tanks or storage um, facilities of uh, schools with water. Um, essentially, this included the procurement of the actual tanks, um, the loading and the distribution of those tanks, uh, taking them to schools, installing them temporarily for those schools that needed water immediately, and, um, and lastly, as I indicated earlier, to go to those schools that have got tanks but not no, no water and uh, fill their tanks up. Um, to give the scope of our work um, effect, uh, we signed a tripartite agreement amongst ourselves, the Department of Basic Education, and our sister, our um, shareholder, Department of Human Settlements, Water and Sanitation. This we finalized on the 12th of May. We received funding on the 26th of May, and um, we started in earnest. This agreement was uh, signed following the establishment of Department of Water and Sanitation National Command Center at our head office in Renwater in Johannesburg South, um, at the backdrop of the declaration of coronavirus um, a pandemic as a national disaster on the 15th of March by our president, His Excellency President Cyril Ramaphosa. The, that was following a very successful provision of water to schools underpinned by the delivery of over 7,500 tanks to all the province from um, our command center. Just in terms of the progress to date with respect to the supply of um, tanks and tankers um, to schools, um, the, we had a target of 2,634 um, tanks that we had to supply to school. Um, within this period of time. Uh, but what is important is to, to emphasize the 2,634 that we had to cover does not necessarily mean all those schools were without water. Bulk, a sizable number, well over 95% of those tanks that we are supplying to the schools were indeed augmentation of the storage capacity and capability that those schools actually had. So of the 2,634 tanks, that is the storage capability or capacity that was requested from us from this program, we managed to supply 2,443 um, tanks. Those tanks, um, essentially, uh, most of them as well, will cover for the rest of the schools as we progressively uh, go back to, to schools and um, reopen and let the learners of the other grades to really start learning. So it is important to have these numbers understood that the difference is not lack of water into schools, but the difference is the actual augmentation that the schools required, not only for the grade 12 learners and the grade 7 learners, but the rest of the schooling. So with this 2,400 that we have um, provided. Um, in part, it includes um, the rest of the school grades as they go back. In terms of the tankers, um, we have cutted and procured these tankers and have supplied over 2,900 schools that 
actually wanted us to fill their tanks that already had the storage capacity. The original target was 3,257, but of course we wanted the schools, the grade 12 and the grade 7 to get going quickly. We targeted 2,900 schools. The rest of the schools will come as we progressively um, open the schools. In terms of the provincial breakdown, um, the out of the 87 tanks um, required by the Free State, um, we oversupplied and we supplied eight, 180 tanks, um, again, to cater for additional grades as schools progressively open. Bumalanga requested 127 tanks. Um, um, all the 127 tanks were supplied to the province. Northwest, 64. All the 64 um, tanks have been sent to the schools in the province. Limpopo, um, Limpopo requested 475 tanks, mainly to augment their storage capacity. A total of 499 tanks uh, were received and dispatched to the province. The challenge of Limpopo, by and large, is precisely because it's a water scarce province. And these tanks that we're distributing will assist with additional storage capacity to enable these schools to store water during this period of drought. Almost similarly with KZN, the requirement was 1,125 tanks, mainly to, to augment what they have. Um, the, the target of uh, 1,125 as rainwater we share with the province and um, of the 1,125 1, tanks um, that um, is required in the now for the augmentation in the province, we oversupplied with, um, um, to the tune of 1,843 tanks that we have secured for the province. 483 have already been received and the rest is being manufactured to meet the challenge of um, water augmentation and storage in the province. In the Eastern Cape, uh, Eastern Cape requested 759 tanks. Um, to date, they have received 605 tanks to the schools and the rest of the tanks are in transit um, on their way to, to the schools. Uh, what we've also observed in the last two weeks of our involvement in the project is that you do have a situation where in a province you find an oversupply of tanks. It could be in one district and in other districts um, you have an undersupply. What you're going to be doing also in phase two is to find a way of uh, rationalizing the supply of storage capacity to schools. Some of the schools that we have found have um, 19 tanks per school. Um, they were requesting an augmentation of two so that will make one school to have 21 tanks. So indeed, um, our observation by and large is that we have well over 95% uh, coverage of water in our schools. And in fact, most of the schools have no less than five tanks. And bulk of the work that we need to be doing going forward as we receive uh, Molinas is to augment. In the Northern Cape, they requested 17. Um, they received all the tanks. Houting and Western Cape did not form part of our scope, as in the main, the, the, all the uh, schools um, had tankers. Um, Houting, the challenge of Houting is not access, but as it has been mentioned, the challenge of Houting is vandalism, and then we are, will be assisting them as we progress. Of course, we experienced various challenges. Um, some of the uh, terrain and topography in certain provinces resulted in tankers and delivering of tankers taking long to fill those tanks. The distance between the schools, meaning rural areas, tankers took long to move from one school to another. We also experienced um, local economic uh, participation by uh, unreasonable business fora, demanding more than a fair share of their participation in the project. Thanks to the defense, um, we managed to get into those areas um, uh, we got assistance in that regard to do so. We also found that we had to disinfect, disinfect 
apologies. Some of the tanks that we found in the schools, so we couldn't just fill quickly and move. We had to disinfect to ensure that we have enough and residual chlorine to enable the tanks, um, to enable the schools to have uh, drinking water that is compliant with South African National Standard 241 of drinking water. Some of the um, um, challenges that we experience have been uh, because we are working round the clock, our schedule, because in an emergency um, you had to open the schools at odd hours, so we had to wait a little bit. So we are thankful for the principals and the deputy principals and the members of public that enable us to open the schools and supply tanks into those areas. So in conclusion, um, as part of the way forward, the work that we have done is for phase one. Um, what still needs to be done is that um, we need to deliver the remaining uh, remaining tanks um, to, to the schools across the provinces that we're covering. Uh, we believe that in a week or so that will be done. Um, the installation will be ongoing. Um, the DG indicated that we need to get some of the tanks installed. We'll continue to do that. We'll continue uh, tankering to, to schools, um, particularly those um, that um, have tanks or storage capacity. While we appreciate the agency of supplying water, through water tanks and the usage of water tankers, these methods are not necessarily the most cost-effective and sustainable way of supplying potable water. Um, they will also, we will also look at uh, the broader approach of ensuring sustainability. And this is our next phase, that as soon as we get uh, tanks filled with the tankering services, we're going to work with the Department of Basic Education, find a sustainable way of supplying water through various reticulation systems, stand pipes, and um, the usage of boreholes. Thank you so much, Minister, um, for the time. Bulaya Mudupi. Thank you so much. Uh, Tatemosai for the presentation. And I am now going to ask Mr. Gordon Kosa to please ascend the stage. Your presentation is ready. And uh, we wait to see what you have to say with the work that the department says it has done. Thank you so much. Minister, uh, Deputy Minister, uh, the CEM, that's uh, Provincial uh, Political Heads of Education, <coughs> DG and colleagues from the provinces and the National Department as well from Rainwater, and the members of the media, good evening. So as you know, in the past you know, month, from around the 4th of a May, we've been monitoring the preparation for <coughs> teachers and learners to come back to schools. Initially, for the target of 1 June 2020, as the minister and the DG have indicated, the 28th or 29th of May was the D-date. We also went to the Minister and the Council of Education Ministers to share our observations of the levels of readiness at that point. And our overarching observation was that majority of the in majority of the provinces, majority of the schools wouldn't have been ready to reopen on the 1st of June 2020. Today, Minister, my, my job is a very light one because I can confirm that that situation has changed significantly in all the provinces. And as a result, our observation is that majority of the schools in most of the provinces will actually be ready to receive the teachers and the learners on the 8th of June um, 
which is tomorrow. So perhaps, uh, you know, just to uh, ground what I'm saying, um, you will remember that we've been tracking the delivery of the relevant COVID-19, you know, supplies. The DG told me this morning that they are not PPEs. PPEs are only for the Department of Health. So indeed, we've been tracking the, the procurement and the distribution of those supplies from the provinces down to, to the schools. We've been collecting data on a daily basis, you know, from the schools. And I can confirm that by the end of Friday last week, we had 11 rounds of data collection that was done on a random basis daily. Thirdly, we started going to schools to go and observe what uh, would have been happening, you know, in the schools um, to ready themselves for the reopening. As I said, the situation across the country has, has changed, you know, significantly. When we went to see Minister and CEM on the 28th, we were comfortable. In fact, we observed that two provinces could comfortably receive um, you know, learners and teachers um, on the first, by the 1st of June. And about four of them were in the medium category and three were in the high risk category. And we used a very stringent methodology to calculate exactly the, 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 the percentages of readiness. Uh, the DG always challenged me and I said to DG, the data that I consider is that which is verifiable. And on the basis of that verifiable data, today we have majority of the provinces that demonstrate, you know, comfort uh, levels to receive learners and teachers across the country. In particular, six provinces present a very comfortable position to um, receive learners and teachers. And the other three, most of which were in the red or medium, are actually in a medium category. And what it means to be in a medium category means that, you know, some sections of the provinces may not yet been covered or sufficiently, as the DG had indicated. Of course, the second rider that one needs to take into account is that um, some of the data that uh, we use to arrive at our conclusions had still been lagging until... The, uh, yesterday. However, that process of mopping up the data is continuing. Um, the, the readiness uh, index right from the, the 23rd of May has been increasing and in fact it increased much more drastically you know, towards the end of the previous you know, two weeks uh, up to where we are. I'm not going to go through these figures uh, but I just want to say in passing that between 74.4% and 87.2% of the schools were, when we went to visit them on Wednesday, were open. The teachers and the school management teams were on site, continuing to complete the preparation of the sites to receive the rest of a, I mean, the learners, you know, next week. Um, a percentage of schools in the category in the range that I've mentioned indicated, uh, in fact, had masks for teachers and had masks for learners. They had use, usable water, um, and about 84% of those had sick base. Uh, they had sanitizers. Um, screening was set up in the schools, and we can confirm out of the 177 schools that we visited ourselves, um, there were screening uh, uh, systems set up, so we screened ourselves. So they had the essentials such as thermometers, uh, training to staff was provided in the majority of those uh, schools. Those who have uh, nutrition programs were starting to prepare to feed the learners uh, when they come back. And they had the necessary, you know, washing soap. And majority of those, in fact, 53.8% 53 on Wednesday last week, principals said they were ready to reopen. That was Wednesday. And in fact, some of them indicated that they were waiting for cloth masks, which we had actually flagged. And those cloth masks were received, we confirmed, by yesterday, uh, you know, Saturday. 
which actually um, leaves us with a situation where most of the provinces that, uh, in fact, the number of provinces that had high comfort to reopen moved from 2 to 6 between the 28th and the 6th of June. And those who are in the medium category actually was reduced from 4 to 3, meaning that more moved to the high you know, comfort. So um, we had most, uh, a lot of uh, recommendations to make you know, to um, you know, the department. And in fact, it doesn't help me to repeat you know, those recommendations, but only to say that this report of ours is quite consistent with the report of the DG. Um, we are on the same, um, you know, uh, page in terms of the levels of, of readiness. And um, I just want to thank you, Minister and CEM, for having heeded our observations, you know, at that point when we came to report to you. And I want to join uh, the department and the rest of South Africans to welcome back our learners and, uh, and teachers in fact, you know, wish them a happy landing, you know, tomorrow and productive learning time going forward. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Kosa. We will now be connecting with the MECs from the different provinces from the and, different provinces. And uh, we will request that they speak for about three minutes because we still need to deal with questions. And uh, I have my colleagues, Ignatius, as well as uh, Irene, they're both at the telephone call desk as well as the WhatsApp lines where we'll be receiving questions. So please prepare those questions so that we're able to deal with them when the time arrives, but I'm going to ask Mr. Modau to, to assist us to connect the MECs that are in the different provinces. I'm going to start with the MEC in the Western Cape, Ms. Debbie Shaffer. I'm aware that the MEC in the Northern Cape is struggling with connectivity, uh, but we'll keep trying to locate him. The MEC in the Eastern Cape is currently at the Provincial Command Council where he's presenting uh, his state of readiness report. So uh, please do not be surprised if you do not see him on the screen or if there are questions that are directed at the Eastern Cape and is not available to deal with those questions. It's because he's engaged elsewhere and it's equally important and critical that he addresses the Provincial Command Council there as well. Uh, Mr. Medeo, can you please uh, come through so okay. that we're able to take the input from the MEC, starting with the MEC in the Western Cape. Thanks, Elijah. I will um, uh, bring up the, um, the uh, MS team for uh, MECs in the provinces, and I'll just go randomly uh, selecting um, I think the one which I think I can start with, which is ready at the moment, the Western Cape. And then I will also ask if all the other MEC from uh, other province, uh, provinces to mute your your audio so that you don't come through. And then only when you are called, then you can you can you can come through. So we'll start with uh, um, with the Western Cape. You can go ahead, please. You can go ahead, please. Thank you, you very go much. Ahead, please. Good. We have um, um, our systems are ready to go. We uh, we have already got uh, eleven schools that will not unfortunately be able to be open tomorrow because of contamination issues. They have had COVID infection, so they will be contaminated. And we have two schools um, that are closed because of uh, urgent issues regarding water supply that we have uh, now to attend to. Other than that, all our schools are ready to open um, out of 1,500, so fewer than 1% are, are not uh, operating, but they will be in the next very short while. Um, we've procured a lot of uh, um, equipment for safety measures. We have procured two cloth face masks per child and per uh, teacher in the province. 
as well as temperature scanners, sanitizer, bleach, liquid soap and disinfectant. We have also issued detailed guidelines to schools uh, to assist them in the preparations, especially um, roles and responsibilities of different staff, orientation, screening, cleaning of schools, feeding, psychosocial support, managing learners with comorbidities, safety of learners on the learner transport scheme, managing, managing hostels, uh, ma managing COVID-19 cases in schools, roles and responsibilities of SGBs and managing the curriculum. And all of these can be found on the WCED website under the Back to School page. Uh, we've also developed a monitoring tool which is, can be accessed through our normal online school system. And this um, provides for the schools to answer yes or no to a variety of important questions so that we can have our online monitoring of whether schools have been cleaned, that they have the right procedures in place, that access control has been strictly limited and is monitored um, that the physical distancing is taking place and they have all their materials in place. We also have ensured that physical distancing is ha going to happen and we will maintain the distance of one and a half meters between learners in all our schools. At the moment that's not a problem because of the lower numbers of learners coming back but our schools are also currently working on a plan for when the new uh, the additional learners come on board so that they can uh, maintain that distancing, um, including, for example, uh, having different classes on different days or splitting classes so that we can ensure that the classes are not overcrowded. And obviously there will have to be measures put in place then for learning of the learners who are on or not at school on a particular day. Uh, thorough cleaning of schools has taken place. We have engaged with the learner transport providers also to ensure that they institute the appropriate sanitation measures. We had 100 inc incidents of burglary and vandalism in the province from the 20th of March to the 25th of May. 48 schools required emergency repairs and maintenance and 45 of those have been completed, but the others will not inhibit the schools from opening. They will be completed in the next very short while uh, and they will be closely monitored, but they will not prevent the schools from opening. Um, I think that Minister is broadly where we are at the moment. Thank you. Okay, uh, thanks very much. I will now bring uh, Limpopo. Um, um, Limpopo, when you're ready, you can just, uh, you can speak. Uh, thank you very much and good afternoon to everybody. In terms of Limpopo, the facility schools have been cleaned, uh, social distancing have been done, the masks have been uh, distributed, the sanitizers have been distributed, thermometers, soap, guidelines also have been done. Our worry was the water and sanitation issue. And I must commend Red Water and Department of Basic Education for assisting us to, to deal with this matter. As I'm talking now, they are on the ground making sure that the outstanding water issues are attended to. Also the sanitation ourselves together with DBE are on the ground now, making sure that all the uh, uh, schools with pit latrines are provided with uh, mobile toilets. The scholar transport, uh, have, uh, uh, scholar transport uh, service providers have been uh, given disinfectants and sanitizers just to make sure that as the learners come in, uh, they are sanitized and also the vehicles are disinfected and also they've been given a, a, a manual to say how do they deal with this issue. The school nutrition also is on. Uh, sc uh, schools were reporting yesterday and on Friday that they are receiving food supply. They've trained uh, food handlers and everything is on top. Uh, in terms of the classes, uh, they've been prepared in terms of social distancing. Educators and non-educators also have been trained I must say also there are some principal in some part of Limpopo who have not been at the school since the 18th of March. Uh, we just hope that they'll uh, show themselves on, on Monday tomorrow and then we'll start to making sure that those schools also come on board. Uh, I've received a letter from one school in November where the parents are saying they, they don't want the school to be reopened. Uh, I will go and check them to, to understand what their concerns are and assist them to do that. All in all, Limpopo, we are ready. Uh, we have worked so hard. We have received all the support that we needed, especially from our provincial command council. All MECs will be out in all the schools. 
uh, checking that everything is in order. We have our own provincial war room where we are receiving challenges from schools and a repeat response uh, team where, where there are challenges, we are able to send their teams. All of our SMSs have been given number of schools to make sure that it is their responsibility, that everything is in order. And where I am, is system go for Limpopo. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks very much, Limpopo. Uh, we will now move to, uh, I think it's uh, Mr. Mshengu in, uh, in KwaZulu-Natal. So if uh, you can hear me, Mr. Uh, Mr. Mshengu, you can go ahead. Well, thank you, and uh, thanks to the minister and all the colleagues. Uh, firstly, let me confirm the report as presented by the DG. Safe to say that the number of schools that are not ready has been reduced to 104 schools, uh, given the work that has been done uh, during the course of today. Uh, all our schools have received the necessary uh, masks as well as um, other essentials. The challenge that remains particularly to those schools that uh, are said not to be ready is around the issue of water and, and, and sanitation. But uh, the program as, uh, as, uh, is continuing uh, with the rainwater also on board, as well as getting assistance from the South African National Defence Force. That is why um, we can now confirm that uh, the schools that are not ready, which will not be opening tomorrow, uh, is 104. And uh, we have made the uh, necessary arrangements uh, for those schools so that learners are sent to other schools that are ready uh, to avoid the situation where there are learners that uh, are, are again uh, left out insofar as the curriculum uh, recovery is concerned. As the province, we have procured uh, all necessary essentials for the period of six months and they were not uh, expecting any shortages uh, in, 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 in between. Um, screeners have been appointed, uh, including those that uh, will be uh, stationed to all our uh, scholar transport uh, providers, uh, and 417 of them will be dedicated to scholar transport so that we are able to screen learners um, before they even bought uh, uh, the buses uh, that are provided through scholar transport. There were over, just over 400 schools that were vandalized, uh, particularly during the period of lockdown in the province. Uh, out of those, there were only 10 that uh, were really in, in need of uh, mobile classrooms, uh, which we have provided and completed. That yes. The rest, uh, uh, renovations uh, and repairs are taking place because it was just an issue of a window or a particular door, as it were. Uh, the training of teachers is continuing. Uh, we could not uh, meet our timelines uh, in terms of the training of teachers uh, because of the then disputes between uh, the department as well as the, mm -hmm. the unions. But uh, we now are confident that uh, since we are working together facing one direction, training will, 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 will then uh, proceed in a smooth way. The greatest challenge or risk that uh, we will face, uh, obviously, is vandalism. And uh, we do want uh, to to call on our communities to work with law enforcement agencies as well as the department so that we isolate these criminals uh, and we say our communities must stop uh, being a market of stolen properties because these things that uh, get stolen from our our schools uh, they get sold to communities but uh, in summary KwaZulu Natal is ready save for the 104 schools which uh, in according to our plan should be ready by the end of this week thank you so much Thanks uh, very much, KZN. Um, I think I will now bring uh, MEC Mpumalanga. In Mpumalanga, uh, uh, Mr. Majuba, you can go ahead, sir. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, let's uh, appreciate to be given this opportunity. Good afternoon to Minister and afternoon to all my colleagues. What we can say in Pumalanga is that uh, we can confirm the reports given by uh, all the people who gave the reports there and we say that uh, we are trying our level best as we said to be ready and as of now what we can say we have got 43 schools that uh, we can say they won't be able uh, to open tomorrow and that is 
strictly based on the question of uh, water tanks that have not as yet arrived in those schools. We can say that water tanks have arrived in Pumalanga, but they have not as yet arrived in schools. Therefore, but if, this, if they can be delivered in schools, we think that uh, we will be able to deal with the question of water, possibly maybe by today or tomorrow. The question of uh, surgical masks that we were given are uh, also the ones which gave us the red spots in that report. What we can say now is that we have got uh, cloth masks have arrived and have been delivered and uh, we are quite sure now that uh, we are ready when it comes to the question of masks. All teachers were trained uh, and uh, screened and officials and uh, we only had a problem of 147 schools that uh, were vandalized, but uh, 77 of them needed to be uh, fixed, and we were fixed all the 77 schools. The remaining schools that were not fixed are those which had minor challenges, such as uh, broken windows, and uh, the SGPs dealt with the question of those windows which were broken. What I can say that is that in Pumalanga we had uh, uh, very good support from all the structures, uh, starting from uh, the Premier to all uh, MECs, to all councillors, to community. Uh, everybody was just uh, at play, making sure that we ready ourselves for the reopening of schools. I can confirm that uh, we are quite ready. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks, thanks very much, um, Pumalanga. Um, there seem to be technical problems where we don't have all the other uh, provinces here. Uh, we just uh, want to wait for them to, to dial us in and then we will, um, I think, um, Elijah will direct us what you do from here. Oh, free state. So we can take the audio link from his state if it's thing. Okay. So we'll bring the audio link only from uh, Free State, and if the MEC in Free State is ready, you can go ahead. Uh, Free State, ah, oh, yeah, you're there. Thank you. You can unmute yourself. You can unmute. <laughs> ah, that's lovely. Thanks very much. Sorry. <laughs> thank, you, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Now I can uh, confirm that uh, as a province of the Free State, uh, we are very ready for, for the learners on the 8th, and, and, and we must really thank the, uh, the SGBs, the parents in our communities, because they played a role uh, in helping us uh, to deal with this state of resonance. I must actually also agree that um, uh, we have sent all the COVID-19 essentials sanitizers, liquid soap, masks, thermometers, disinfectant, standard operating procedures, all of those things uh, were delivered to all the schools in the province. Uh, we must also mention that uh, the deep cleaning had, done, had been done. Uh, it was mostly done by our parents and volunteers from the ground. Uh, the issue on the issue of water and sanitation, um, Yes, thanks to rent water. I think we've got enough uh, water tankers now, um, or, or, or Jojo tanks in our schools. And I think that uh, the only challenge there and there is just to make sure that uh, the water is filled. Uh, we have also appointed cleaners uh, um, in all the schools. We gave schools a provision and a formula to appoint cleaners. Uh, we have also appointed screeners uh, uh, in all the schools, and they have also been trained already by the, the Department of Health. Our relationship with the, the Department of Health is very, very strong because they are the lead uh, department on this program, problem of uh, COVID-19. We've also uh, made sure with the Department of Health and Social Development that uh, we link each and every school to a primary health care center. So there's a nurse allocated per school, there's a, a clinic that is allocated per school. So teachers and then people at the school know that if there's a problem with a, any problem in a school, 
they, they know which which person to talk to uh, in the in the Department of Health. We have also addressed issues of social distancing. Uh, you know that uh, this 1.5, the president said, is non-negotiable, and therefore we, have, we can be rest assured that uh, uh, the social distancing issues have been addressed. And, and then the training um, uh, uh, of officials, the principals have been trained, SMT members have been trained, teachers have been trained, and in majority of our schools, we have also seen the parents. The parents them, themselves have come for orientation and training. So they understand what needs to happen and therefore be able to support their own learners. Uh, the voluntary health, uh, uh, I mean, the voluntary food handlers have also been trained. So we are ready with that. Uh, I must just say also that in our province also we had uh, about uh, 72 schools that were vandalized. As I'm talking to you, for the past two weeks, uh, the contractors were in the schools. Uh, they have addressed issues of sanitation. Uh, there may be one or two problems uh, without finish. That has not been finished, but uh, I think we have moved a lot because the contractors have been there. We have also been have appointed a group of uh, CDP officials just to focus on broken windows, fixed broken doors and so on. So we have used this uh, platform also just to address some of the issues that we have not been able to address uh, uh, in, in, in the past. So yes, as a free state, we can confirm that we are ready. Uh, the curriculum streams, um, uh, the, pre the teachers have been, I've been to schools myself where teachers have been really looking at a timetable, uh, reorganizing themselves and pepping themselves up for opening. So I'm sure that uh, we will have, we may have problems tomorrow, uh, one or two, but most of the problems that will come are problems that we can fix. So Free State is ready, have been ready, and I think uh, we are going to get uh, 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 everybody excited by going to school tomorrow. Thank you. Okay, thanks, uh, thanks very much, Free State. Um, uh, I think we're still waiting for a video link from Northwest. It was ready now. Uh, oh, yes, yeah, it's there. Uh, Ms. Matsimela, you can go ahead, please. Thank you very much. And my heartily greetings goes to all of you. As a province, we are looking forward to, to the return of our grade sevens and the grade twelves, our special schools included uh, independent and private schools in the Northwest tomorrow. We have prepared and have been monitoring our readiness for the past weeks. To date, we are convinced that indeed we can restart it tomorrow as a Department of Education in the Northwest province. We have appointed the screeners and the cleaners. Uh, sorry, and if, where there will be challenges, I think we will deal with those issues as soon okay. as so fine. Okay. yeah can you just tilt down Hello? your monitor please tilt down your your screen we we're not getting the um the uh, your face properly just tilt down please <laughs> yes thank you <laughs> thanks very Am much okay? yeah go ahead is it okay with me yeah it's it's fine now thanks hello is it fine Thanks. Can I continue? Yeah. Yes, you can. You may. Can I continue? I can't hear. Yes. Thank you, you very much. <clears throat> I've been saying we have, we have appointed the screeners and the cleaners in our different schools, and I believe where there will be challenges, we will zoom into those immediately. The orientation of SMTs and teachers has taken place, and we are looking forward to the orientation of our learners regarding COVID-19. Some schools use the past week for orientation of learners and their parents in the Northwest province. Though we have started a bit late in line with the procurement of our PPEs, but right now, I must say, we have managed to procure and deliver for the returning learners. 
We will continue with interventions where there, where there are challenges. And I also, moving forward, want to make the people of the Northwest aware that a lot of our schools have been vandalized during the lockdown. But to this far, we managed to zoom into that area whereby the Department of Education has taken over to repair all those damages. I also want to thank our stakeholders. I want to thank school communities, parents, and in our case, the mining houses that have actually assisted us a lot. They have managed to donate the PPEs, including cleaning of some of our schools. We will not rest until we have resolved and prepared for even those learners that are coming in July and August. In conclusion, I want to thank the good team of the Command Council in the Northwest Province led by Premier Job Mokoro. I want to thank you for the support that you have given to us as a Department of Education for some time. And we believe that we will never, never actually try to compromise any life that we are intending to receive for tomorrow in the Northwest Province. I thank you. Thanks very much, uh, MEC. Uh, I think now we're just waiting for the uh, uh, video link from the MEC in Houting, uh, um, Mr. Panyaza. This if you can go ahead, sir. Uh, thanks so much. Uh, truly appreciate the opportunity. <clears throat> uh, we are going to be brief. We'll give the report uh, starting with the stage of readiness. Uh, firstly, we want to take this opportunity to welcome all the reports that have been presented. We really believe a, they are a correct reflection of the state of affairs, in particular in our province. Uh, because this is mainly a health problem, uh, we've started developing partnership with the Department of Health to provide all the relevant support and want to go through the kind of support that they've provided. And we honestly want to thank both the Premier of our province, but also the Executive Council and the MEC responsible for health in our province. Thus far, they've made almost 155 nurses available, and they've also made almost 52 vehicles that are located to provide support to our province in case of any emergency or any positive case so that they can respond speedily to the challenges that are within our schools. They've also made available environmental health practitioners who are going to monitor both social distancing, but most importantly, analyze every situation within our schools. They've also made general practitioners, that is our local doctors, mainly in our township areas, who will start at our schools first uh, before they go to their surgeries. And this kind of support is highly, highly appreciated. We can confirm as Haute that we've concluded all the deliveries of PPEs in all our schools. There's no single school that does not have PPEs. We are dealing with challenges of the quality of some of the PPEs as well as the numbers uh, because of the increased role in some of our schools. But our team are dealing with that aspect and we're quite convinced that uh, come tomorrow, all these particular matters uh, will be resolved. We can indeed confirm that all our schools have been cleaned. We have received reports from all our agencies that have been given this particular mandate, and we are quite excited uh, that all our schools have been cleaned. We have appointed uh, almost 1,800 young people. We have concluded their training. We have deployed all of them uh, to our schools, two per school. We have started with uh, schools in Quintal 1, 2, and 3. Uh, these are mainly schools in the townships and rural areas. And in the next few days, we'll distribute these young people to other schools in Quintal 4 and 5, where we believe that in the, last, in the next phase of bringing other learners, we'll increase these numbers from 2 to 4 per school of young people. We want to thank these young people who are highly qualified, committed, and who also attended training under difficult circumstances. We really uh, are indebted to them for raising their hands to support and ensure that we push back the virus. We can confirm the training of all our teachers. 
as well as the training all of our uh, school management teams, as well as the procurement of food and the training of voluntary food handlers and those that will be transporting our learners. I want to quickly go to the numbers of school readiness. Uh, I think the DG unfortunately went through some numbers that we could not uh, capture. We just want to clarify that, uh, that we've got 2,000 2,089 schools uh, in Gauteng that are catering for both grade 12 and grade uh, grade 12 and grade 7. Of all those schools, uh, we can confirm that of the 2,089, 2,078 are ready. Uh, we only have 14 schools that are not ready. I'll go through their names so that the parents can be aware that their children uh, will be allocated to other schools. They must not go to their main school and they must uh, make contact with the school so that they can know uh, uh, the nature of the problems. Here mainly is vandalism and issues related to uh, water and sanitation. Unfortunately, Minister, uh, we really believe in Houghton there is an organized formation that is deliberately destroying our schools. They are targeting the taps, the toilet seats, and also uh, stealing water taps in some of the institutions that we have. Even though we are trying to fix that situation, we really believe some of them might not be ready tomorrow. So in Ekuruleni, we have a school called Winile Secondary School in Gauteng East. We also have Kumbulo Secondary School, Lion Park in Johannesburg North, Flair Off Primary, Udong Middle School, Atleham Primary School, Ramosukula Primary School, Sanganani Primary School, Ols Mandal Primary School, Nancy Field Primary School, Jatin Deu Secondary School, Ekunjeni Primary School and Wedela Technical Secondary School. Those are the 14 schools that won't be read in Gauteng. With Wedela, the minister, we have a problem of Zamazamas. It's one school when every time you open it, the Zamazam, because it's a technical school and it's got technical material that Zamazamas are utilizing, they normally come and uh, take those uh, technical tools. So we're trying to find a long lasting solution for that problem. Those are the 14 schools that are not. That will not be ready uh, uh, tomorrow. Uh, we've reduced that number from 69. Last week, Friday, we had 69. We've reduced that number to 40. And unfortunately, Minister, we also have schools that is not going to open purely because uh, either learners and staff members have tested positive for COVID. Uh, of the schools, we've got 30 schools uh, that uh, uh, staff members have tested positive. Of those 30 schools, 26 are public schools and four are independent schools. Of Also, of those 30 schools, there are uh, six learners that have uh, tested positive. This is a confirmation that uh, our systems are working because all these learners and educators were tested within the school premises. And that's the reason why we could pick them up uh, before they could uh, proceed to be part of the schooling population. So thus far, we've got 30 schools. And of those 30 schools, 26 uh, are public schools and four are uh, uh, private schools. In terms of uh, 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 protocols, all these particular schools, uh, we've started the process of uh, cleaning them up and we've already been given the go ahead in some of those schools uh, to reopen. We've got a long list of those schools uh, where staff members have tested positive. We'll put that list on our website so that uh, parents can be aware of those schools and the status of each and every school. Where the school have been closed, we have indicated. Where the schools have been, the school have reop has reopened. We have also uh, uh, stated that fact. I don't want to waste your time, Minister, and go into the names of those particular schools. In terms of readiness tomorrow, uh, uh, Minister, we want to declare scouting that indeed we are ready. Uh, besides those 14 schools. And we keep the situation. Uh, 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 we'll monitor the situation, and we are, remain we remain hopeful before the end of this week. Even those 14 schools uh, 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 will reopen them or re reallocate uh, these learners into other schools, so that uh, their learning is not disrupted. We want to also thank all our partners from the teacher unions, NGOs in the education sector, learner formations, for providing guidance, in particular. Uh, the Gauteng Premier and the command structure of Gauteng for their continuous uh, counsel and support uh, during this period. Thank you so much, Minister. Truly appreciate the opportunity. Uh, th thanks very much, uh, MEC. Um, I think we, 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 we can't take 
uh, Eastern Cape and Northern Cape at the moment uh, due to other reasons. And the, um, uh, I will also ask the MECs to please stay online for Q and A's later on um, in, this, in this briefing. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Mudao, and to all the MECs for the contributions that have been made this afternoon. We hope that it will enhance understanding in terms of the work that has taken place in the basic education sector since we started planning for the reopening of schools. I'm now going to go to the next phase in the program, which is question time. And I'm going to check my two colleagues, Ignatius and Irene, if we can start. Um, do we have any phone calls up there that we can start with? Uh, please give me an indication. And we do, all right. Um, after the phone questions, we'll then go to the WhatsApp line. I do not see Irene. But she, oh yeah, all right. Thank you so much. All right, let's go to the phone lines. Uh, who is on the line? And uh, we hope they will introduce themselves and who they work for, and then they will proceed to ask their question. Yes, Mr. Frank. On the line, we have Mercedes from SABC. Please proceed. Yes. Uh, can I continue? Yes, please. Okay. Okay, Minister, uh, you take uh, advice or you took advice from experts before a decision was taken on whether to reopen the school. So, but uh, some of the medical uh, experts and other experts have also been saying in the media that children from zero to nine do not really contract the virus. Now, by last weekend, statistics revealed, and we heard it on SABC radio, that uh, 755 children under the age of nine contracted the virus. What do you say about that uh, versus what the experts have said? Given that you also do take advice, you know, on your decisions, you don't just uh, reopen the schools. Uh, the second question is to MEC Debbie Schaefer. Uh, uh, MEC Debbie Schaefer, I just heard today from Dr. Sadiq Karim in the Western Cape Health Department that more than 1,700, basically more than 1,700, uh, 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 almost 1,800 children under the age of 20 are infected to, or were infected with the coronavirus in the Western Cape. So basically, it is children from 0 to 19. And uh, 119 of these children under 20 are from 0 to 1 years old. 100, almost 120 children from zero to one years who have contracted the virus in the Western Cape. Now, my question is, how many uh, young children who might be grade seven and, uh, and matriculants who are in this figure, who might not be able to report to school tomorrow because they are still infected with the coronavirus? So uh, that question, I also want to extend it to the other MECs, if they can tell me if there are children who will not be uh, uh, grade 7 and matriculants who will not be reporting for the uh, 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 I mean for school tomorrow because they are still infected and my last question maybe to both the MECs and uh, to the minister but it's more the MECs perhaps who should answer this children are members of society first before they are learners so you say you have prepared the schools it's all well and good we can see the preparation thorough preparation but what preparation has taken place at a societal level to make sure and to understand whether children are ready to go back to school? So uh, have the children said they are ready to go back to school? And the reason I am asking this, uh, Minister, and to the MECs is that I have spoken to one 13-year-old who, who said to me, I'm not scared of the virus. My mother says the coronavirus is an animal disease and it doesn't affect us Africans. So that's it. And there's a seven-year-old I spoke to, and when I said, why are you in the street in Danun? And he said to me, I am not scared of the coronavirus because coronavirus is not in Danun, it's in Kailicha. So this preparation at a societal level, the embassies can also tell me how, what is it that uh, 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 they have done. And further, with the remaining children who are at home, are you going to make sure that you have that preparation at a societal level first? 
so that when the children go back to school, they are not, uh, the burden is not going to be on the teachers to teach them about the coronavirus and so on. Preparation at the societal level. Are you going to do that as well? All right. Thank you so much for that list of questions. Yes, please uh, identify them, please, for us. Karima Brown from ENC. All right, uh, please proceed, Karima. Hi, Elijah. Um, the question I have is to the MECs um, of Western Cape and Gauteng, if they could just give a breakdown of how many uh, teachers at various schools have been infected with the virus and whether those schools um, are going to be closed and whether those schools are counted in the um, readiness that they have given, uh, the figures that they've given um, when they did their three-minute briefing. Um, the other thing I wanted to talk about is all the schools have indicated that they've trained um, teachers and school managers. Can anyone in the department give me an idea on who's doing the training? Is it outsourced? Uh, is it done by the Department of Health? Is there a tender process? And exactly what are people being trained on? And what are you using as a yardstick to check whether people have actually understood the training? Um, and then the question on vandalism has been raised by quite a few schools. I want to know from Minister Mochecha whether she has met with the security cluster, given the fact that the um, Gauteng NEC has gone so far as to say that the vandalization of schools is in fact an organized crime effort. Um, so why are schools not being policed better? And if they are, or if there are plans to do so, can you share them uh, with the country? Thanks. Thank you so much for the questions, Karima. Do we have another caller? No, Mr. Chair, we don't have another caller. Thank you so much. Can we move to the WhatsApp line, please, Irene? Thank you, Chair. We do have quite a number of questions on WhatsApp. The first two questions are from Evelyn Morris from Kexton, Devon. She's asking a question to the Minister and KZN MEC. Is there adequate communication between the KZN Health Department and the decision makers about basic education in the province to ensure parents and schools are given adequate information about regional and district data reflecting cases, recoveries, death? and testing in each of the hotspots in Kaiserin. She's also asking, is there any plans to prevent schools from excluding children whose parents are not able to pay fees, school fees due to hardships resulting from lockdown and general economic down, downturn due to the pandemic? Another question is from Betty from TV Lagos. She's asking the minister if there are any arrangements or provisions for grade 7 and 12 learners who are still stuck outside the country. The fourth question is from Homolemo from UTV. She's saying the minister said visiting schools is prohibited unless you have an appointment with the principal. Will the media be allowed to visit schools to assess the state of readiness? Those are four questions for now. All right. Thank you so much, Irene, for those questions. Um, I'm going to ask the minister and the DG and perhaps the deputy minister to deal with the questions that they can deal with. And then once they are done, we will ask the MECs to respond. And Minister. No, thank you very much. Elijah, for us as a sector, the coronavirus is a health, mainly a health problem, then a social, economic, and political problem. As a result, we are all guided by the Department of Health in what we are doing. So in terms of experts having contradictory information, we, as I say, in our team, we, we have the Department of Health because we need a central structure so that we really don't find ourselves, today it's yes, the other day it's no. 
but just always consistently be advised by health. But in addition to that, we take all the necessary precautionary measures to make sure that nothing slips, whether we believe that children are, are less vulnerable, we're not taking chances, we're doing all we possibly can to make sure that we close any other loop or risk. That's why we're having phased intake, we're doing all the necessary steps to make sure that even if our theories about the vulnerability of children is, is correct or it's not correct, but we have taken all the necessary steps. In terms of us speaking to the community as a sector, as I said, we're, we're led by health. So we can't be leading a health issue today. The Minister of Health is speaking about the rising education. Department of Communication has public education. Then we also have our public communication. We work as one government. So we do our part in the schools to orientate, to induct and train teachers and also educate our children. Then the other parts of government also do the other part where we don't necessarily operate. Uh, the visitation to schools, we really highly discourage visitations of schools. I think if we understand that we are still under lockdown. It was good, I think, in the past weeks when we are doing school readiness, parents and committees were coming to help us. Even in, that, in those instances, parents had to safe distance, had to wear masks. Now that children are going back to schools, we highly discourage any other person to come to schools because we're still in lockdown. So which means whether journalist, whether parent, other, I mean, some school governing bodies were saying parents should be allowed to walk into schools. We don't know who is infected. Sometimes we are told that some of, of our visitors refuse to wear masks. So to make the school's lives easier, let's go back to the normal. To say you just don't necessarily walk into a school under normal circumstances and just say you are coming to inspect school readiness. Why, that's why we took all the trouble to inform you that indeed our schools are ready. Most schools had even invited parents in those schools to familiarize themselves with the environment, to see the conditions under which their children are going to be received. And we think that that's why it's, it's enough because we could be risking just infections from outside, from people who really are visiting schools. So with all the humidity, we highly discourage people from this week to visit schools. We want to try at all costs to make schools green areas so we would wish to only have teach learners, teachers, and the, the support staff, and nobody else coming to the schools who's not part of the school community. And, and, and I think that's a humble request, so not that we don't, because people have helped us now because we think we're ready, we don't want them back. But it's also part of the precautionary measures to make sure that we don't uh, uh, transport or spread the virus. Colleagues will help me about the other one. Uh, school fees, you know, the matter of school fees, we have left it to schools so that parents can engage with the school governing bodies with the, we can have a, a, an overall policy, can really go and make their case. The way we always, they always make cases where you want exemptions, when you want reductions. They must engage school by school and be able to present their case to the principal and the school governing body and then the school governing body must satisfy itself that indeed there is a need to assist. Because at the end of the day, if you're not paying fees, you are going to be sustaining your child's education at the cost of other parents. And that's why it's very important to engage school by school and not have an overall policy. And I'm sure schools, if you make a very strong case, will be able to assist because indeed we do expect that now with the lockdown easing, there's going to be lots of depression and difficulties that communities face. But that's our recommendation. In terms of vandalism, yes, indeed, I speak to my colleagues, but we also know that policing is better down on the ground. So different MECs are interacting with their safety departments to see how they can really uh, clamp down. 
I know, for instance, when I spoke to MEC Sufi, that police in Gauteng have done more than 100 arrests. So they are working very close with police. They had also requested them over the weekend, this weekend, because we expected lots of problems over the weekend, now that we are saying we're ready to open. So as Lisufi said, there's a feeling that there's also a, de a deliberate effort on the part of other people to really undermine. Either we suspect it could be tenders to say if they break schools, they break doors and other things will run to the nearest uh, person to come in uh, and repair. We're still not sure. We're still speculating. We just think also there's something that we don't understand. For instance, this week, this week will speak for himself. They had requested their local safety department to do more policing in schools, but we can't get police just to really sit in our schools. There have been also very helpful instances where communities themselves have done a community arrest, where at night they'll, they will see any... This is, is some uh, 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 action in their schools or activities in their schools, blow a whistle, go and do committee arrest. So there's been quite a number of com committee arrests. And unfortunately, in some instances, I know for a fact uh, from the township where I was born in Pinville, there have also been community where people took law into their hands and killed some of the people who vandalized the schools. And you're appealing to people that even if you see a school being vandalized, don't take any law into your hands. Do a committee uh, arrest if you can, but just don't take law into your hands. There have been, as I said, lots of incidents where communities themselves have assisted in, pro in protecting assets in their communities, but it's an ongoing pro 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 problem. And I'm not sure, DG, if I left other things and uh, DM, uh, because I was taking notes and other questions were running quite fast. Yeah, Minister, I think the, you, you, you have answered the issue about the 700 children, but I think even the Western Cape will answer on that. There's an issue of that children are members of the society. And indeed, children are members of the society. So there can be no plan of children that are at home which is different from that of members of the society because when they are at home, they are members of the society. And the training that members of society are getting, the same children are getting it. We have been taught, all of us, by health, that we put on masks, that we keep a physical distance, that we wash our hands, and all those little because they are at home, they know that. And when they come to school, we'll also train them to just emphasize what health has taught our children. The, the remaining... Minister, I think it's for KZN, Western Cape, and Kauteng. There's about two. Oh, okay. okay. Did you? Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, there are about uh, three questions. The other one is uh, Karima Brown's question on who is uh, training teachers. We've put together a training manual, um, in fact, uh, guidelines for training of teachers parents, uh, non-teaching staff, and learners. This guideline has been put together by us and the Department of Health. I chaired meetings which uh, uh, conducted the orientation or socialization to uh, district directors, to circuit managers, who in turn, together with officials from the Department of Health, um, in some of the provinces had to do the same on a cascade model uh, to district officials who were going to train teachers and teachers together with the school management team will then do the orientation of learners. Is not your classical dictionary definition of training is just a socialization into the new environment uh, that uh, teachers, non-teaching staff, and learners find themselves in. So it's important to, to, to just remember that, but we also acknowledge, as it would be the case all over the world, that it has to be a lived experience. Uh, training will tell you conceptually what you're going to be, to be facing, 
And in your day-to-day -day experience, you'll then have to use the knowledge that you gain from orientation and apply it as you navigate your environment. So that's what has been done. Karima, no tender here. We didn't consider tender at all. And then the issue of... Um, there was an issue, Minister, about uh, parents who are going to lose jobs and uh, consequently get their children excluded from schools. In public schools, our policies are very clear that uh, parents who cannot afford to pay, uh, the school will have to accommodate uh, learners. So in public schools, I can safely say that uh, that will not happen. In independent schools, I think uh, we are working with organizations representing independent schools. They do understand the situation we're going through. They are very sympathetic uh, to uh, parents who are affected. And uh, I think they, they will be compassionate in dealing with this matter. So together we'll, we'll, we'll navigate the route uh, with independent schools. The last one, it's about learners who are outside the country. This matter is dealt with at the level of uh, the net joints uh, of DGs and the National Coronavirus Command Council. We are working with uh, the Department of Home Affairs and the Minister of Home Affairs in particular will be uh, working with the Minister to help to deal with this matter. I attended a meeting this morning that gave us some uh, light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, including learners will be coming um, from other countries coming to the country. Learners who are crossing uh, borders between South Africa and neighboring countries every day. And I must also say that uh, this afternoon we met with key stakeholders looking at our directions to make sure that they accommodate uh, uh, this uh, prevalence. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I think... Um here online on our MS team, we have uh, uh, questions directed to KZN, Houting, and 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 the Western Cape. I think I will give um, the uh, Western Cape to start with their response. Western Cape, go ahead. Their response. Western Cape, go ahead. Their. Uh Thank you. I think most of the questions were, were dealt with by the Minister and Deputy Minister. The, the issue of um, children getting COVID, I don't think anybody has said that children don't get COVID. I certainly haven't heard that. Uh, what they say is that the, the risks of them getting it firstly are low. Secondly, if they do get it, it's, uh, they, they get it very mildly. Uh, and the chances of them getting it sick very badly are, are very, very small. Obviously, if any child has it, they must not come to school. And I want to just really, really re-emphasize that. If your child is showing any symptoms of COVID, please keep them home. Um, and obviously, if they have been confirmed positive, they must stay at home for 14 days before coming back to school. As far as um, positive cases in our staff are concerned, we have currently got 66 staff uh, that are affected um, from 55 different schools. I think that was all. I'm sorry, the line wasn't very good. I hope I've answered everything. Thank you. Okay, thanks, thanks very much. Um, I will now move to uh, KZN. Uh, I'm just waiting for their video link. KZN, for please. Their video link. Okay. Go ahead, KZN. Yes. Go ahead. Well, uh, it is just an addition to, to the response by the minister on how we relate with the Department of Health. At a provincial level, it's on three levels. One at the subcommittee levels where we established uh, committees that uh, look into various aspects of preparation for our schools. Uh, secondly, it's a level of bilaterals between myself and the MEC for health, including senior officials. And the third level is a level of the provincial command council as uh, chaired by the premier. So we are working uh, very, very much closely with the Department of Health and taking counsel and directive from them, particularly as they are a leading department in the fight against uh, COVID-19. Uh, there are two districts that are giving the province some kind of a headache because of the high rate of infections. 
that is Etewini district as well as Ilembe district. Mm -hmm. They the coordinated uh, comprehensive plan by the provincial uh, command council uh, to attend to those districts, including a strict enforcement of uh, a, a, a knockdown as well as uh, other precautionary measures. Uh, from the side of the department in those two districts, we'll be doing some random checks or other testing uh, in different parts of, 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 of the schools uh, around those two uh, districts. If uh, it was not for the backlog of Department of Health, uh, we're going to, to be testing every learner and, and all the teachers as it were. Uh, but uh, we have been advised by the Department of Health that uh, they're experiencing uh, quite uh, a huge backlog, uh, given the fact that uh, they are continuing at a massive scale with their community testing. So we'll be doing random checks, uh, rather testing, uh, in our schools, particularly around the Tebwini <laughs> district and um, uh, Ilembe district. Thank you so much. Okay, thanks very much, um, uh, KZN. I just want to check if how thing is there, uh, Minister Wanyaza. You can go ahead. Wanyaza, you can go ahead. Wanyaza. Oh, sorry. Let me see. <laughs> <laughs> yep. I am not finished. Thank you so much for the opportunity. There are four options that we have provided in Saudi. We really believe that very important for parents. So that there must be no parents that say, I'm not taking my child to school. We really believe that it will be a problem if a parent can say, I'm not taking my child to school. Uh, we provided four options to all parents. The first option is class contact. And we've given uh, full details on class contact. Because we really believe it's a very important element. The second option is homeschooling. We had the deadline for homeschooling that was uh, around July. We've extended it to September. So that every parent that means they can teach their children on their own. They are given the support and they are, they are given the guidance as well and their resources. And okay, um, I like uh, 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 where people were really using online systems. Uh, we want to continue with that uh, support as well, but parents must truly register using the law. Uh, so that they, they don't just want their children to continue with online learning without proper documentation, that is registration, support, so that the school can be aware that the learners continue with, uh, 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 with key learning or online. There is a process that the minister has initiated here so that there is uniformity across the country. Uh, it can be a solution of how they work. It needs to be a solution of the country. Uh, and we are working very hard on that aspect so that we can make our contribution. The last aspect, it's learners that they have uh, comorbidities, so that those particular learners as well are given support. These are learners with special needs, and these are learners that you believe that may not interact with other learners, especially those learners uh, that uh, their sickness is late, immediate attention, and continuous support. So, within that context, therefore, we are providing that support. So, we really believe with all the options that we are providing as a, a department. Every parent can choose the best option that suits their children. We don't want a situation where a generation of learners miss an opportunity to go to school. Because all experts and those that know the disease or the virus that are dealing with, they say we don't know how long will this virus be with us. So we urge all parents to pick up four, one of the four options that we have provided so that in the ultimate end, we can build a strong uh, 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 skill base for our country so that our children can contribute. Yeah, to the economy of this country. Thank you so much, Chair. Okay, thanks very much. Uh, I'll also ask the min the MECs please to keep the uh, the video link up, so that if there's any technical problems, we can deal with it. We deal with them as they come, and then I just listen up for the next uh, round of questions. Thanks. Thank you so much for that first round of questions. We will now go to the second round of questions. Um, I'd like to get an indication from my colleagues in the booth. I can see Irene is ready. I'm not sure if Ignatius is ready. Uh, let me go to Irene. She raised her hand first. Uh, Irene, let's take the questions on the WhatsApp line, please. 
Thank you, Chair. We have received 30 more questions. The first two questions is from Wonga from Ingonjani FM. He's asking, uh, he's saying the minister has mentioned the challenge of blockages by local business people who believed they were not given opportunities to render services. Does the department, national or provincial, concedes to not following the right procedures in awarding tenders? The second question, he's saying, has the department reached out to the angry business people who blocked the delivery of PPEs, especially in the Eastern Cape where sanitation is still a huge issue, and when can they expect the deliveries? The next question is, is from Nazir from Glow TV. She's asking, does the Board of Small Private Schools have a choice to not open schools despite parents willing to send their kids to schools and the school staff implementing the necessary safety measures? Also, are parents or SGB members allowed to visit classrooms as they deem fit? The next two questions are from Raymond from Rhodes Music Radio. He's asking the minister, uh, he's saying there are schools with pending maintenance work in Makanda. Is the minister aware of the situation and is it being attended to? He's also saying there are reports by teachers that some schools received only one paper towel and cloth mask that are only one layer. Has what is expected in schools made clear and how is monitoring of service delivery by appointed companies? The next two questions directed to the minister are from Sidwell Guduga from the Mail newspaper. He's asking, do you feel the science is clear enough to show schools are safe to reopen on June 8? He's also asking, what should parents do if they have a reason to believe that the scholar transport bringing their children to and from schools are not implementing appropriate safety measures, particularly for peoples with complex needs or increased vulnerability? Those are the questions for now. All right. Thank you so much, Rind. Can you see the Ignatius in Tagawan? In the calls? Yes, Mr. Tranga. I have a follow-up question from um, Mercedes uh, from SABC. Yes, good afternoon again. Okay, uh, Minister, uh, I just want to know, and from the MECs, uh, there's been the issue around human fumigation tunnels. Uh, are they going to be used at school? Uh, we've heard that these are very dangerous. I heard the Professor Karim uh, last Friday saying these are very dangerous. There's one in Parliament which is being used. It's continually being used. I heard Minister Mbalula saying they're no longer going to use those. But I want to know at schools, is that going to be used? And just to follow up on the issue of the societal question that I've asked. The reason why I ask this question is not because I asked it just from my head. When, when the first announcement was made, uh, the ministry said you had partnership with health departments, with student bodies, and so on. And that's where the societal question is coming in. And I hear the deputy minister is saying children are being taught at home because that's where you start in society. But this is the coronavirus, and children are not coming from, from, from a holiday. So the question is, there has been this lockdown, for example. Did you, when I say partnership, did you prepare at the societal level? Were you able to communicate with parents to say, look here, Teach your children that when you wear a mask, even those who are now uh, uh, still at home, use this lockdown period, teach them that when you wear a mask, when you go to school, you are not to share it. Even if it means a father and a mother or uh, you have to play a mask game today with a child or tomorrow a social distancing game. That is what I'm talking about. But uh, the question is relevant. That's why I did ask it to the department because you had partnerships before and you had partnership with health. So it was not a misplaced question. Thank you so much for, for that question, uh, Mercedes. Uh, you did not need to justify your question, but <laughs> um, it's all right. Um, Irene, can I come back to you? Do you have any new questions that we could forward to the ministers?
Yes, Chair, I have four questions. Please proceed. The first question is from Linda Mnisi from Newsroom Africa. He's saying, we know that Gauteng has decided to employ what they call the Youth Brigade to assist teachers with screening. But what kind of support will teachers in other provinces have? The next two questions are from Bongekile from Mail and Guardian. She's asking the minister and MEC Debbie, what informed the Western Cape to go ahead and open schools last week when there, were, when there was a national directive from the minister that schools will only open on January the 8th? Gauden was also ready to open, but they did not. So because he's saying Gauden was also ready to open, but did not do so because minister had issued a directive. The second question to the MECs. Can they say if their readiness also applies to having sufficient textbooks, particularly for grade 12 learners who share textbooks? In Free State and Eastern Cape, for example, she's saying she has spoken to teachers who say they have no textbooks at all. This then means without sufficient textbooks, social distancing will be compromised. The next question is from Christian from Network 24. He's saying, uh, how big of an issue is the installation of water tanks in the provinces? Can schools be considered ready if water tanks have not been installed? The last question is from Chris from International News Network. He's asking the minister, uh, some kids with underlying breathing problems like asthma will be required to wear cloth mask as well as plastic face shield which can be detrimental to the children's health. Can this be enforced as the child already wear a face shield? That's, that's it for now, Chair. Thank you so much, Irene. Um, I'm going to ask the CEO of Randwater to deal with the tanking question. And thereafter, I'm going to request the minister to to deal with the other questions. And we'll come to the MECs later. And Dadan, I'm down. I'm going to tell you to tell you. Oh, I'm going to tell you. Yeah, just with respect to the issue of um, tanks um, in schools, I think our observation is that um, Approximately over 95% of the schools have got um, a sort of um, source of water and it ranges from, as the question rightfully says, um, schools that have their own water tanks, but um, there are other schools that have their own reticulation systems. Um, other schools may not have the water tanks, but they depend on the boreholes. Um, so by and large, all the schools um, or schools that have no, um, as, as a critical factor, that have nothing whatsoever. Um, I don't think those schools will be ready. Um, but um, what we have seen also is that um, various schools also make their own provision um, for those that don't have tanks to get uh, the schools ready in time. Uh, but our observation is that by and large, all the schools have got some sort of um, barring a few, some sort of um, access to, to water that may not necessarily be from the water tanks, but from boreholes. Um, we have also seen some of the community members or community supply systems, network and reservoir supply in some of the schools. Thank you. Okay. Now there was a question about school transport and the answer which I also gave in the briefing was that as a department, we work with the Department of Transport and are guided by the protocols that transport has put in place about how many people can be accommodated in a bus, in a seat, and what the procedures are. So we have ensured that transport that we provide as the state, that it will comply with uh, transport protocols. On the issue of transport, 
of parents or organized by parents, which we, are, we have no control over. We have requested parents to pay more attention, to step up and make sure that what we do on the right hand side, they also do on the left hand side so that there's synergy in what we are doing because some of it may not be con a, a, a transport that is in our control, maybe even parent parental cars where they take the children's friends and all sorts of things that will be happening. So our humble request is that parents also should make sure that they pay attention and they follow the health protocols. In terms of fumigation tunnels, we have sent a circular, did you speak to it, to schools to really say this is the advice that we have received from health and therefore uh, would wish our schools not to use those tunnels any longer because we are also guided by health. On the question of partnerships with communities, uh, I thought I'd answer to say COVID-19 is a health issue in the main, and we are led by health. So in terms of the communication that has to be done with the public, it's led by health and also Department of Communication. On our side as a department, we can only interact through with communities through organized structures. In all meetings, we have our school governing bodies with us. So you would expect that the leadership of school governing bodies as a representative of parents take forward the process of educating parents. We also, through the NECT, work with a network of more than 200 NGOs and CBOs which have a direct interest in education. We link with them also through their communication. Again, those are the people we see as partners that help us as a department to interact with communities. We also, as I say, work with uh, other formations. Uh, for instance, your faith-based organizations has come, have come to the fore to say they want to work with us. And that will help us to also get the reach out. So as a sector, our limitations are, are really around working with organized formations. It will be difficult really to expect the principal to be able to do community mobilization outside any structures because they have to run and maintain schools. But we are reliant on our partners, on our social partners, to do the outside part because our link with the community is through those organized structures. Uh, how the youth brigade, different provinces have are using different ways to respond. For instance, I know in Limpopo, they have what they call education administrators who then will be doing the screening and supporting this because most of the schools don't even have administrators. Just the management of movement of people in schools, as I say, when the school gate is shut, no one comes in. So different provinces, in terms of their own cap capabilities or their own arrangements, have made arrangements. So what we need as, as, as the Department of Education is to say, do you have people who are going to screen? Whether it's in some schools where I went, it was a, a, a teachers of grades that are not going to be phased in, who, working with their colleagues, are doing the screening of their colleagues and the screening of children whilst their colleagues. Because there are some teachers who are going to go to schools who are not going to be able to, who will not be teaching. So, so the school has made an arrangement that they should be screeners. Some schools are not very comfortable with strangers coming, especially with the whole problem of pedophiles and other things, they've made their own internal arrangements. So our interest as nation is that, do you have screeners? Will they be at the school gate on time? Have they been trained to do the, the work right? Will they be able to, so how to, to deal with protocols? But different provinces have come with their own different innovations. What how things doing is very different from Northwest, very different from Limpopo, but for us, the principle of having screeners every morning. Gauteng, for instance, had said, health said every morning it will be able to go to schools to check if everything is well. You can do it in Gauteng. Gauteng is this round. You can't do that. You can't have that arrangement in KZN. You can't have it in the Eastern Cape or Northern Cape. So there will be arrangements which are suitable in other areas but may not work in other provinces. But the principle remains, do you have screeners? Have they been trained? And do they know what to do? Yeah. I think she was sad to me. <laughs> I'm not sure what.
I left out. DJ, you can also help. Yeah. Whilst DM is uh, picking up on some of the questions, uh, Minister, indeed it is true. Uh, in our uh, assessment, I mean, even in the presentation that I've made, these are some of the questions that we're asking. Do you have cleaners? Do you have screeners? Have they been appointed? Have uh, they been gone? Uh, have they been taken through some orientation program and so on? So uh, you can check. Uh, I'm sure we'll even put the presentation on the website for people to check for themselves. So there's no province that would say that uh, they don't have cleaners, uh, they don't have screeners. They, they would uh, in different forms, as the minister correctly pointed out. The issue of uh, learners with asthma and uh, whether it's necessary to put a cloth mask and maybe considering an option of a face shield uh, I think it would be appreciated if we could get that medical opinion because we are not aware of such medical opinion. You know, in a public health crisis, uh, it's advisable to take uh, advice from uh, uh, medical experts. Uh, so uh, we're not aware of this opinion uh, from any medical expert that says if you have asthma or um, any respiratory disease, you shouldn't put on a cloth mask. I'll, I'll be uh, um, willing and ready to, uh, you know, to consider that so that we put it in the system as well. The issue of fumigation, Minister, you said I must add, indeed we issued, uh, uh, we communicated with provinces and shared the advice that came from the um, uh, Ministerial Advisory Committee led by Professor Karim from the Department of Health. In addition to the advice of the Ministerial Advisory Committee, the Science Society of uh, South Africa also advised through the Department of Health to say, communicate with the Department of Basic Education Fumigation is actually more dangerous than the virus uh, to the lungs of anyone who will be occupying facilities that are, that, that are fumigated. And it is on the basis of that that we dispatch this communication. And then the, the issue of the some schools that are still under maintenance, yes, uh, in our meetings, our morning meetings, this information has been shared that in some provinces they have considered uh, alternatives uh, to the existing structure of the school because the uh, big uh, uh, portion of the physical facility is under maintenance. In some cases they said school will not uh, resume on, on Monday. These are some of the schools that uh, learners might not be received on Monday. They would either be redirected or um, the day to receive learners would, would be delayed by a day or so. Um, and then the issue of the cloth mask with one layer. Uh, again, the Department of Health developed specifications together with the Department of Trade and Industry. And we use those specifications for anyone who indicates capacity um, to provide uh, and the know-how to provide cloth masks and they are expected to comply with specifications. When people receive these goods they have to check them uh, in order to determine whether the goods delivered comply with specifications. Uh, the last one is around uh, oh last but one Nazir Small schools, our directions that the minister referred to are very clear about small schools. Small schools are allowed uh, to um, receive learners. We've also made a special provision for deviation for small schools with enough facilities, like multi-grade schools, where they could be allowed. Because in a multi-grade school, you might find that each grade has got one learner or two learners, and they probably have uh, enough room to uh, practice social distancing, adhere to health and uh, safety requirements. 
they would be allowed uh, to bring even more grades. And then the, the last one, uh, Minister, it's around business, uh, people who blocked uh, service providers from delivering COVID essentials. I indicated in my presentation that uh, it happened in the Western, in the Eastern Cape, sorry, Eastern Cape and Gauteng. In Gauteng, it was uh, in Sidibeng and uh, some parts of Temba, Hamanskral. But the law enforcement agents were brought in to deal with the matter in Gauteng. In Eastern Cape, MEC Gadi spent the, the, the whole of last week to unblock uh, the blockages in Owar Tambo and Alfred Nzo. And he reported in a meeting of education ministers that these blockages have indeed been unblocked. Thank you. Thank you, DG. Uh, again, to add to a question by Nazir on the board of private schools, uh, we request that the board of private schools engage parents because if there are issues, they must deal with the issues with the parents, not uh, depriving the learners an opportunity to learn because education is a basic right, so they cannot. So we, we, we call on them that let them engage the parents. Uh, did you, the, there was a question about uh, school in Makanda. I thought it would answer because Makanda is in Eastern Cape. That's the one under maintenance. Oh, it's the one under maintenance. But they, they, the complaint was there's only one paper towel and how do we monitor the the... the PPEs, <laughs> we'll still call them PPEs. <laughs> yeah, on the youth brigade, Minister, I was in KZN. I found that KZN has appointed young people mm. to do the screening and the, the yeah. training. Same as Mpumalanga. When I went to Mpumalanga, I found that they've appointed young people to help in the cleaning because the general workers may not be enough. So, like Minister indicated, that province we look at its capacity and its capacity to can pay and then they will they, they will do as they did uh, yeah i think uh, on the asthma you responded well but we also not encourage people who have asthma to can go to school but we minister indicated that we'll find a way that these children also uh, receive education so on, on Mercedes' question of, of society, Minister, yes, I did respond. Mercedes, we welcome that. that uh, we had not thought that, we, we, we believe that our engagement with civil society, with associations of school governing bodies, they, those sectors are representing parents. And uh, we also, under the impression that all South Africans are being taught by health, health minister, health MECs in all the provinces, and health practitioners. So, but now we will find a way of engaging with parents and encourage them to teach the children to wear masks and exercise and practice social distancing and practicing washing of hands most of the time. We welcome your suggestion and uh, we'll take it forward. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Deputy Minister, Minister and DG. We will now go to the MECs. Uh, I can see now the MEC of Education in Gauteng is uh, comfortable, seated, is now wearing a jacket, is not driving anymore, um, which helps this process. And uh, I hope that we'll be able to tackle some of the questions that were directed to him in Gauteng. Um, there's a question for the MEC in the Free State. We are going to start with you, uh, MEC in the Free State. I'm just going to ask uh, Mr. Mdaw, Gratunella Dan Funalin. Thanks very much. Uh, I, there, were, there were various um, questions that we asked to all the ministers, and I'm just going to go in order. MECs. Thank you. 
Uh, I'm just going to go in order on how they pop up here on my screen. I will start with, with uh, Houting. Let me see the Sufi. Please mute silence. Uh, thanks so much. I think the question that was raised about how it was mainly about the youth brigade. I think the minister covered covered it very well. That it depends per province, and provinces have utilized various systems and mechanisms. Uh, it doesn't mean that when we opted to use young people, other provinces didn't use young people. I think it's a mixture of all the issues that have been presented. But what we can emphasize that there is a need to protect learners. There is a need to protect educators. And also there's a need to protect the community and, and I think uh, we need that partnership uh, with our school governing bodies and we need that partnership with community formations and organizations that are outside our school premises. Even though our initial uh, plan is to release uh, the youth brigades, uh, we really believe it's not the end. We can provide, we can also receive support from community structures and other organizations that believe they, provide, they can provide support on condition that uh, they get necessary training and necessary accreditation. And with that, I think we can work very well. But uh, we, we acknowledge uh, the, the ideas that have been presented and the guidance that have been given, and we respect that part. Thanks so much. Okay, uh, thanks uh, very much. We we will now move to, um, okay, I'll just see which one has popped out on my screen now. I think Free State is ready. Uh, Free State, if you can give me video link, please. Okay, I'll take, yeah, Free State. Let me wait for Free State. Yeah, Free State, you can go ahead. Free State, you can. Yes. No, thank you very much. I can also confirm that um, the screeners that have been appointed are young people residing in the proximity to the schools. So it is also, all of them are young people. Uh, we just don't call them COVID-19 brigades, right? Um, and also that uh, many of them, as we reported, will be um, uh, attained by the Department of Health. We also work with the Department of Health, but also that the Department of Health itself has appointed nurses, the Department of Social Development has appointed uh, 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 social workers who will be working with these people to give the support to the schools that are necessary. And there was a second question that was saying that uh, there are teachers in the free state who say uh, children don't have uh, textbooks at all. I, I, I must just uh, uh, you know, say to the, the, the person who asked the question, just uh, to understand that I go to schools on a very regular basis. Uh, we run a system here in the Department of Education in the Free State where teachers, parents, learners themselves can raise issues if there are specific issues like that. So I can confirm that uh, at least in grade 12, we make sure that each and every learner does have a textbook. So, I, I don't think there is, this statement is correct that says learners uh, don't have textbooks at all. Uh, it may be that uh, a learner may have found a textbook there and so on and so on. That needs to be replaced. But it will be um, uh, an anomaly to say you've got a school where learners don't have textbooks at all. I think that is, that is not correct. And, and also, you know, if you look at our schools, you may even find that uh, uh, schools uh, favor the grade 12, the exit classes, grade 12 and grade 7. So these are particular two grades that always have got textbooks. So I think that uh, if there is schools like that, we would be happy to hear uh, from the journalist or whoever asked those questions to give us facts so that we can go back and, 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 and actually go to those schools to go and check what is happening. Uh, thank you. I think those were the questions that I wanted to respond to. <coughs> thank you so much, uh, MEC Free State. Uh, in fact, let me take this time to thank all the MECs in the provinces who joined us today. In the provinces, who the CEO of Rainwater, the Demosai, the CEO of. Uh, NSCT, Mr. Godwin Kosa, 
the deputy minister, the DG, as well as the minister for the time that we had today. The deputy minister is actually leaving now for the Northern Cape uh, to assist the province in monitoring the opening of schools tomorrow. The minister will be in the East Rand tomorrow monitoring the opening of schools as well. And this whole week will basically be monitoring. And MECs across the country will also be visiting schools tomorrow to just see how things are going. So it's, uh, it's work that we need to do and we'll be doing that work and we'll be providing an update on an ongoing basis. It's difficult to answer all the questions uh, at one go, but uh, as the developments unfold, we'll be able to accommodate even those questions that we're not able to take today. Uh, thank you so much for the time. Uh, DG Moeli, thank you so much as well. And uh, all our partners who participated in putting together all the presentations and the work that has taken place across the country. That's it from us. Good evening. Thank you so much. Thank you, Minister. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.